Welcome back to You Regina 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as part of a Bachelor of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be talking about Diogenes, uh, an ancient uh, Greek philosopher um, born about or lived about uh, from 412 to 323 BC. We're not really sure. They didn't really record when he died quite accurately, uh, but. We'll uh, kind of get into it as we go. Uh, he is no Turing or Aristotle or Polya. Uh, for him, it's not as simple as marking some things down on paper uh, and kind of getting to some clever result uh, and then continuing to live a normal life. No, this guy's a little bit more fun than that. Uh, it's telling that one of the first Google results for this guy's name uh, was, in fact, the Encyclopedia Dramatica. Uh, that should give you kind of a hint of where we're going with this. Uh, Wikipedia says, quote, Diogenes was a controversial figure, unquote. That's a little bit of an understatement. That's like saying, Weave holds controversial beliefs, or Hitler didn't like Jews. Well, yeah, that's true, but there, there's it's a little bit more than that, right? So, no shit. Uh, so, especially in this day and age of social justice warriors, sensitivity training, and safe spaces, Diogenes was blunt and not apologetic, quote, of what use is a philosopher who doesn't hurt anybody's feelings?" Unquote. He's the founder of the Cynic School of Philosophers, and if we use the word cynical today, it's because of him and kind of referring to the way he looked at things a little bit. And unlike Aristotle, his writings didn't survive, so history uh, has not been kind to him in that regard, although he was apparently a prolific writer and influenced many people with his writings alone. But he was kind of a master troll. Uh, that kind of set the bar for future trolls to kind of live up to. Uh, he rejected what was merely uh, uh, conventional uh, as a matter of rule. So uh, going back to the fallacy of the beard on kind of how it's dangerous to do that, but regardless, this is kind of one of the ways that he lived. Uh, you know, going all the way back to when he was still kind of living at, at home with his parents or whatever, uh, and his father minted coins for a living. So, you know, go back to the Isaac Newton video uh, for a little bit of that. Uh, but he debased currency. So his father's making the coins, and he's destroying them. Uh, badly enough that he ended up getting banished from his city for doing so, uh, which was kind of a you know, sucky thing back then, uh, although it certainly happened occasionally. Uh, and so, apparently, the city, you know, if I'm pronouncing that right, was disputed between the Persians and the Greeks at the time, uh, and so it was actually kind of a smart thing to debase the currency, uh, depending on your political persuasion. Because if neither the Greeks nor the Persians face, you know, their rulers weren't on the coin, it wasn't really clear that you could use that coin in either of the two empires. But you could use it locally in the city itself, because everyone kind of knew what coins those were. Uh, so it was kind of a way to keep the city from falling into one or the other side uh, would be to just debase it or to cut it or whatever. Uh, and so he was exiled for this. And somebody even pointed out that, hey, you know, you were sentenced to exile. And he replied, quote, and I sentenced them to stay at home, unquote. You know, this is just the kind of guy he was. He would flip things around like that. He would kind of reframe things that were told to him to make the person who was trying to insult him look bad kind of like a mental kung fu uh, that he was really good at at that time. Uh, and he apparently even went to the Oracle of Delphi, like many of the other kind of important figures of his time, and probably many others, uh, and indeed asked for advice, and was told to debase the currency. Uh, he thought uh, originally that that meant to, you know, literally debase the currency, but after some thought, uh, thought that it might actually mean to deface the political currency, not the coins. Uh, either that or he made that story up to gull and bullshit people. One of the two. Uh, but either way, like th this is someone who's got an understanding of what money and currency is that is actually starting to become uh, possible to kind of get again. But where we're starting to rethink what money means and what it means to, to be currency and what, it, what social currency is in relation to the kinds of things we trade to get goods and services, those sorts of questions. That is exactly the kind of thing he would have been going for there, to try to change how we look at not just the 
politics and the political situation, but the, the kind of currency and its relation to it. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, he was captured by pirates and sold into slavery, uh, which uh, definitely kind of impacted him a little bit. Uh, but he was asked as part of being kind of captured into slavery by one of his captors what his trade was. Like, what, what was he useful for? This kind of, you know, getting an older guy, uh, you know, obvi obviously a lot of people got captured as slaves. Some of them had trade. Some of them could build ships or whatever. What could he do? What did he say? He said that his skill was in governing men and that he wished to be sold to a man who needed a master, i.e. a slave owner who needed someone to tell him what to do. Uh, this was a clever enough answer that he was put in charge of his master's children. God, who would put that man in front of their children? I don't know. But they did it, and they, they were, their children were probably better for it, because Diogenes taught their children to live a simple life uh, as a kind of, you know, very, being very careful of how you live and, and careful of how people think about you, etc. Uh, and so he would have put that as, quote, Diogenes the slave is freer than his master, who he rightly convinces to submit to submit to obedience. Unquote. Like th this is amazing that you could have you know get even I in the worst possible scenario where you're literally captured and enslaved, you still put yourself in control by your wits alone and by your ability to see into the humanity of your captors and convincing them that they are worthy of giving you the right to even that much freedom. Fascinating, fascinating guy. Uh, and so he would have viewed people around him as kind of stuck up in their own problems or stuck on problems like being good or evil or whatever, and then just, instead of thinking about it, relying on custom, even if the custom is ridiculous and broken. Uh, so he would have preferred that people actually think about what they're doing, if not always, and at least occasionally, and if, at least if not occasionally, then when mocked by someone, you know, a smart ass like him. Uh, so that would have been kind of the point, or at least one of the points to the things that he did in his life and the things that he would say would be to kind of shock people into doing the right thing, even if they wouldn't do it on their own. Uh, he would have been against people who were kind of fakes. Uh, authenticity was kind of a, a, an important thing, the name of the game. You know, living up to the Joneses because that's what everyone does was a bullshit excuse for him. Uh, it would have been the unexamined life, as we'll kind of get into when we talk about Socrates. Uh, and he lived by example. Uh, he lived and believed that virtue in action is better than virtue in theory. You know, you can you can come up with all these great ideas, but if you don't actually live by them, what's the point, right? Go and actually do do things in life. Make the world a better place. Don't just think about it. Um, and and because of this, and because of the way he lived, and the kind of effort he put into the art of his own life, uh, descriptions of how he lived or how he lived is just as much of a work of philosophy as anything that he could have or did or write. Um, it's just a matter of that was his media. He was his own media, his own body, his own life, his own reputation. Those were his media for convincing other people on how to live and how to live well, even if you don't follow exactly how he lived. And I don't see how anyone pr practically could anymore, uh, e even in that case. Um, he led by example, and it, it's important to kind of notice and see the example that he lived and how it went for him. And he, he did live a, a, live a kind of difficult life. He was an extreme minimalist. Uh, he kind of got rid of all his possessions except for, you know, at one point this like wooden bowl. And of course, you know, he, he lived in a jar or a bathtub, depending who you read. Uh, either way, it was not a house. Uh, it was not something that most people lived or would even ever think about living in, but it made it so that he could survive, and that was all that he really needed. And he lived a long life. Like, he, he was quite up there in age when he finally kicked the bucket. Um, but And he did so to criticize the society around him, who he saw, probably rightly, as corrupt and confused. You know, again, this is the same society that sentenced Socrates to death with pretty much within his lifetime. Uh, you know, the same society that damn near did the same thing to Aristotle. The same society that uh, was having trouble coming to terms with this idea of the written word uh, and what that could mean and the beginnings of natural philosophy and science. And so he lived poor and begged for a living. Sometimes, you know, sleeping, or I mean, his jar or bathtub or whatever was right in the middle of the marketplace. So you could kind of like imagine somebody like wheeling a bathtub 
in like the Walmart parking lot and then just sleeping in it. And then having the, the Walmart security guards go, you know, this is so weird, we're just going to let this happen. That was kind of what was going on at that point. And police hadn't been invented yet. So there was, you know, wasn't as much people, you know, I'm sure somebody could have dragged them away if they really wanted them. But, uh, you know, it was a public space. So he had kind of a sort of a right to be there uh, and, and was more or less able to get away with it. And he embodied his ideas and how he lived, uh, et cetera. As mentioned, he, he had at one point gotten down to just like this single wooden bowl that he was using to like, you know, scoop water up and eat, drink the water and eat or whatever. Uh, until one day he saw a small child drinking out of his hands, at which point he threw the cup away uh, and kind of smashed it or whatever, uh, and quote, a child has beaten me in the plainness of living. Fool that I am to have carried this superfluous baggage, baggage this whole time. You know, unquote. You know, this is the, the perspective of someone who is annoyed that he's been one-upped by a small child in living simply, in living only using what's necessary to live, which the bowl was not. The bowl was just a convenience, something that he didn't actually need, something that he had to carry around with him and probably slowed him down occasionally. And he would wander around. He would go to wherever the hell he wanted. Um, and because of this approach, because of this attitude, and because of his kind of honesty, uh, he, he ended up actually becoming quite popular. Uh, some, you know, small kid or whatever smashed his jar or his bathtub, and that boy was publicly beaten, and uh, the Athenians gave him a new jar because they were kind of so amused or whatever. Uh, and this extended not just to, you know, beating up small children, uh, but all the way up to the leader of the world, which was Alexander the Great, who had conquered, as mentioned in the last video, this huge empire that was, you know, ranging from Greece all, all the way to India, practically. And so this is, like, the most dangerous person you could possibly piss off. He could literally command armies to, you know, capture and kill you and enslave your family, etc. And so Alexander comes up and has heard of this great philosopher and asks if there is anything that he might be able to do for him. At which Diogenes replies, quote, Yes, get out of my sunlight. You know, stand away from the sun, please. You know, it's, it's an obscene thing to do to someone who's that powerful. But at that point, that was who he was. And that's exactly how he lived. And Alexander respected him for doing that. And, you know, continued to talk to him. Or, you know, came back to talk to him later. Uh, and asked, or, and noticed that he was kind of poking around in, in this pile of bones and asked, you know, what are you doing? Uh, at which point he responded, quote, I'm searching for the bones of your father, but cannot distinguish them from those of a slave, unquote. So again, here's this guy who, I, I, I don't know if he'd been enslaved by that point yet or not, but either way, you know, Greek society was extremely stratified and people would look down on slaves as being below them. Very similar to how we would look, you know, or at least people in Canadian society and Western society in general would look down on people uh, in general of, of all kinds of people. I, I don't even have to list them. There's just so many situations in which people in this country look down on each other. Uh, and yet here's this person who's saying that the father of the leader of the world is just as important or basically the same thing as the lowest slave in the whole, you know, lowest dead slave, not even a living slave, a dead slave. So that that, that is kind of a, a very um, kind of leveler view of things, almost communist in, in a sense. Uh, and so he, he lived this way. He, he kind of stood up to authority, spit in the eye of people who, you know, he felt like, and, and literally would eat, sleep, shit, spit, piss on, or jerk off whenever and whenever he felt like it. In public, in front of people, on people, in the theater, in the market, whenever. It was just... He felt like it, so he did it. He was a homeless, filthy, smelly, probably sick half the time, always broke, and lived through some pretty terrible life events, given how little he had going for him. And yet he claimed that he had a good life, and that to fortune, uh, or quote, to fortune he could oppose courage, to convention nature, to passion reason, unquote. So even with what it, whatever would have come to him, he's still happy, he's still enjoying his life, He's still living free, and if there was ever a man who lived free, it was him. Eating in the marketplace alone, that was seen as weird and just not done. And he did it anyway. It's like eating right off the, you know, displays at Walmart. You know, you go to Walmart, 
you like take your can opener, you open the can, right? You know, in, you eat the cold beans right in the middle of the store. Nobody does that. That would be very, very strange to do. Security probably laugh as they're dragging your ass out. And yet this is exactly the sort of behavior and life that he led. Again, as a free man, a man in a very stratified society, uh, a man who, you know, lived in a society that talked about being free. You know, there was rhetoric about freedom, uh, and especially among the property classes. People would brag that they were free. And yet, you compare their lives to Diogenes, there's no question who or what was the free person in that situation. So, when asked uh, by his fellow Greeks, it's like, okay, well, you know, you're living by example or whatever, but where do you see in Greeks the, you know, good men or, you know, the, the proper or the, the, the person you'd aspire to? You know, wh where do you find good men in Greece? And he replied, good men nowhere, but good boys in Sparta, unquote. And yes, that's exactly what he meant. Uh, he mocked people who had elaborate rituals for dealing with death. Uh, and kind of have, would would engage in funerals and kind of give respect to the deceased and uh, kind of look down on people for talking during funerals or whatever. Uh, and, you know, he, he, when asked on, you know, how did you, or how, how would he want to be buried? Uh, he replied that he wanted to be thrown outside of the city gates so that wild animals could eat him, but to be given a stick. And then when asked, well, why would you be able to use a stick when you're dead? And he said, well, you know, if, if I'm not dead, then at least I'll you know, grab the stick and swap them away. But if I am dead, why should I care uh, to use a stick when I'm dead? I, if I lack awareness, then why should I care what happens to me? Unquote. So this is a guy who has a very kind of modern view of what death is. There's no kind of worrying about your body. There's no you know worrying about your soul happening there. It's just, it's over. Your, your food, your worm food, deal with it, um, etc. And so he was, he was kind of interested in uh, living this minimalist life, this kind of life that doesn't really involve needing any thing, per se, uh, although certainly you would need people around you to some extent, because you lived around people. Uh, but he, he was kind of one of the earlier people who really clued in uh, that there was this modern civilization that was beginning to grow up around the, the kind of Greek city-state. And he was very kind of uh, present as far as its problems and the, the kind of contradictions involved in living in modern civilization, in living with technology, in kind of replacing our access to nature uh, with tools, with this, this kind of constructive environment around us. Uh, he didn't really have a very kind opinion of this and preferred to live as close to nature uh, as kind of he was allowed to. Of course, that might be committing the argument to, uh, or the naturalist uh, argument, uh, see the video is uh, for that, but there, there still is a point here, because modern civilization did bring a lot of problems, and it's unclear how to deal with a lot of problems. I mean, global warming alone is seemingly an intractable problem in the modern day, thousands of years later. We haven't really figured out how to deal with the problems that we've created for ourselves by creating abundance and by creating uh, all these tools that make our lives easier. Uh, and he was one of the first to kind of recognize this in a really deep way. Uh, and he reacted to it in the only way he knew how. Again, by kind of living by example, by, by getting rid of a lot of the things that we kind of take for granted in living purely as one uh, as part of a na really basic part of nature. And so the objective of cynicism in his thought was, to a large extent, self-sufficiency and or or the kind of not overthinking things, or not overcomplicating life, being happy, having a simple life, uh, and kind of using your brain, thinking, but again, not kind of getting stuck in your own delusions about what life is and how it can best be lived. He declared himself a citizen of the world, and rather than, say, as an Athenian or a sign uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Socrates did say this first. Uh, but he coined a term for this belief. Uh, he called it cosmopolitan. Or 
And so even to this day, if you go to Wikipedia and try to look him up, you won't find him necessarily, or Google or whatever, you know, you won't find him under his name, under Diogenes. You'll find him under Diogenes of Sinop, or Sinop, which is how people were referred to in his time. You had a name and you had a place that you were from. That was what clued people into who you were. It wasn't, you know, as, as it is today, where you get kind of a last name from your family, which again is still from something, some from some group, from some in-group, that he would have been opposed to. He would have said, I'm not Diogenes of Sinop or wherever, I am Diogenes of the cosmos, of the universe, of the world. Of course, the world and the universe wasn't very big in his days, so, I mean, we can kind of forgive him for not having kind of a, a clue of how big things were. But even so, like, to use the word cosmopolis, uh, again, it's, it's a big thing that, that the universe itself is what he is a member of. That is his family, that is his species, that is his you know, universe of discourse. That is where he's from, that is who he is. And to a large extent, we could try to live up to that. And we would run into problems very quickly because, for example, the, there are discussions going up even as far as the W3C in trying to define what an identity is and how it can be encoded in a computer system so that we can work together and we can coordinate our actions and we can coordinate our payment systems and uh, you know our government and anything else. But the problem is, is we are, if we choose to be, from this place that isn't represented in these systems unless we force them to, which is kind of interesting to note. When asked what kind of wine he liked best, uh, he replied, quote, that for which other people pay, unquote. So again, this guy, he likes his free beer. You know, it's, it's trees and beer that's the important stuff. Love the guy. Um, and so he's, I mean, he likes the idea of, you know, drinking other people's wine. It's fine. There's no, no problem there. But he's also doesn't go to excess on it, or at least not if he doesn't feel like it. Uh, he's not a fan of Dionysus. Uh, those who are, you know, the equivalent of today would be those who kind of work hard and then party hard after it as a lifestyle. That wasn't his type of idea of a good life. Uh, his, his, the idea of work hard to play hard would have been kind of a ridiculous thing for him. Uh, a, a kind of waste of uh, kind of good time or good life, you know, being forced to do things on other people's, you know, bidding. I mean, and, and willfully doing it so that you could partake in some you know, trivial drinking games afterwards, it, it wouldn't have seemed worthy of a human being in his mind. So, when asked uh, to name the most beautiful of all things, Diogenes replied, uh, quote, Parisia, uh, a term that meant free speech or free expression. That was the kind of epitome of you know, the, the, the beautiful thing, the thing that makes life worth living, right there. And that is, of course, Diogenes. So, uh, if you have any questions about Diogenes, uh, there's not that much more, you know, left that can be recorded or that was recorded about his life. But I can try to, you know, look it up. If so, uh, feel free to send some Bitcoin this way, or maybe to some random address. I don't know. Uh, go hard. Uh, and um, as usual, hopefully you enjoy this video. I will see you next video.